um, manager of education with Mass Audubon. Some of us have been fortunate enough to see him present in the past, whether it was on butterflies, which was just spectacular, or uh, you did bees, and uh, he, oh, he, he just remarkable, the presentations he's done. He has a phenomenal background and uh, quite uh, the expert. And uh, without further ado, I'm introducing here uh, Sean Kent and go for it. All right, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Is it good in the back there as well, too? So thank you for that really kind introduction. Yep, my name's Sean Kent and I work for Mass Audubon. I've been there for a little over nine years now. I manage all the arts and nature education programs for the entire state and most of my work is done over in Canton. And before I was at Mass Audubon, I, st I, f I started that STEM uh, Academy at Massasoit that's gonna be here the following week and doing bee research with them and other things there. And then my graduate, was wor my graduate work was on native bees, uh, monarch butterflies, and everything else through there. So I've been teaching and doing science research for about a little over 20 years right now. And what I was going to come and talk today is kind of like the sights and sounds of spring, uh, a little bit about pollinators and bees, a little bit about owls that are all kind of uh, getting really started right now, and then a little bit about bird migration. I'm happy to stop and answer any questions that are going along or, or then at the end. So in a little while, I'll talk about great horn owls and other owls that are on nests right now. This is a picture that, I, and a lot of the photography is mine, not all of it. This is a picture I took on a lunchtime walk last March, almost a year to the day. And there's a really lovely story over where I work in Canton about a family of great horn owls, including two adopted owls there. But Anne also wanted me to talk a little bit about pollinators and bees, you know, and everything that's gonna start coming up you know, when it warms up over the next couple of weeks and everything like that. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the native bees that you'll start seeing in a little bit in the gardens and a little bit about pollination. This is a common eastern bumblebee that's going to a spotted bee bomb, a monarda, that's native here. It's a, a short-lived perennial, two to three years. It seeds really, really well. And I want to kind of talk about a little bit about pollination, but just to show you all these really wonderful adaptations that bees have. So just a little bit about pollination, but I want to more show like the pollen grains here. So if you have allergies and you're starting to worry about the spring allergies, everything on this side right here is a pollen grain. Well, they're both pollen grains and then there's a honeybee covered in dandelion pollen there. But up where the arrow is, only one of those pollen grains, and this is magnified about 2,000 times depending on the size of the pollen, is responsible for your allergies. So which one is it? Okay, so take a second and take a look at it. The other picture right here, these are also real pollen grains, and those are just false colored, so it's a little bit easier to see. All right. So do you have their guesses? Okay. It's this one right here. And what's really neat about this one, and I want you to look closer at what's a little bit different though, uh, from the other ones here. In the yellow where I'm putting the two little arrows, and I'm gonna take them away, those are actually air pockets. So they're basically like little balloons right there. And the pollen grain itself, the yellow's not a good color there, I'll do it in red. This is the pollen grain itself right here, and that's pine pollen. It's a conifer right there. So it's floating and going through there. And if you notice, too, it's a little harder to see, but this part of the pollen, it's kind of one-dimensional. It's not exactly smooth, but there's not a lot of structure on the surface. And if you look at every other pollen grain here, there's all this structure. I heard somebody say the middle one. But if you notice, there's different layers of depth. You know, if, you, if you're looking at it and magnifying it, it goes in different layers where the pine pollen doesn't have that. And that's a unique adaptation to help it be sticky to bees. And here's one of our most common bees that you'll have in your yard, if you can see that. This is about, this is about the size of your, your pinky fingernail to your thumbnail, right in between that size. And in some of the, like at DW Fields, there's easily over 10,000 of these flying around there nesting in the ground right there. It's, it's, it's in a group called Helictus. 
and you can see all the pollen all sticking onto it right here. And here is the eye, here is the antenna, and the antenna, and then another compound eye right there. And if you look, you can see all the little individual pollen grains sticking to its face right, whoops, sorry. Sticking to its face right there. And the main goal for a bee is to get the proteins in the pollen grain, and there's also other things that help make hormones. And they feed that to the baby bees, and I'll show you a little bit of pictures there. And the main goal on the plant is to transfer pollen from one flower to a different flower so it can produce seeds through that. And one of the plants that you can see this really well that I like showing in the yard is any type of pea plant, and you know, false indigo, snap peas, sugar peas, anything like that does a really nice job through there. And I kinda wanna walk through what happens with these bees that are going on uh, right here. And you can see this eastern bumblebee coming in, and it's going to get nectar that's tucked in right where that X is down there, and it's drinking. And at the same time, and think of like a common lily that you might have, a cut flower, and you'll see the, all of a sudden there'll be pollen all over your table if you have it cut right there, and the center of it's really sticky. So the pollen part, that's the male part of the flower, and then the sticky part is the female, and it's trying to, it wants to transfer the pollen to that sticky part, and it's gonna form basically a tube that goes all the way down to where you get the seeds right through there. And you'll notice as the bee comes in to get the flower, here's the pollen grains right here. They rub right on the back side of the bee's abdomen right there, and then this part that I'll circle in purple, that's the female part of the plant also rubbing on there, so the pollen's transferred from one flower to the other. And you can see it in these videos really well that I'll play once or twice. So the bee's going in right here, and you can see it's getting the nectar, and at the same time, it's also working the pollen grains. So it's drinking and it's collecting the pollen right through there. And then the female part of the plant is rubbing it on there. The plant is really uniquely adapted for this. And this is a little bit shakier a video that I took, but you can see the same thing with the bee working, working its legs. So it's moving its legs while it's drinking. It's kind of rubbing the pollen on right through there. And any extra pollen that might have come from another false indigo plant is being pollen, that's the actual pollen surface right there. And you can, again, a little bit shakier, but you can see it really well with the bee's legs. Where you can see it working it on there. So the plant's goal there is to get that pollen transfer, so it's providing like some type of, you know, the sugar in terms of the nectar, but also the protein in terms of the pollen. And the pollen structure is very similar if this was a, a wasp or another carnivore. The protein and kind of lipid uh, fat structure in there is very similar to what it might be eating if it was a caterpillar or a, another piece of prey in there. But bees are vegetarians in that case. And so I want to go back to the bee bomb here as well too and show you this because it's just such a beautiful structure. You can see this also with, you know, um, different species of bee balm that you might have in your yard. So if you look right here, this, it's hard to see, but as the bee comes in here and forces its head down, this is something that you can really look for in your own garden, because this will happen all year, and it's something you might overlook, but just watch it. As the bee head pushes in here, the flower gets pushed up, and the pollen grains and then the stigma, the female part of the plant, push down and rub it right onto the back. So in this case, the bee's most likely only accessing the bee balm for nectar, and the pollen's getting put on its back and rubbed on its head, and it's gonna be incidental. And you can see the pollen sac on its legs right there. But you can see this happening in your yard, and it's this really beautiful co-evolutionary adaptation with the bee and the flower uniquely adapted for one another to get that pollen transfer going on. Um, which is really lovely. And if we think back to this slide right here, so think of the different structures of the pollen grains. Just remember that here. And then we remember the picture of the bee's face right here, okay? And then this is magnified. This is, so what I'm showing here is it's this tiny part of the leg in red. So this is magnified about 2,000 times on that small tiny part of the leg. 
And here's it even closer. And what I want to show you here is you can see that the pollen hairs all of these unique branching structures on it. Same thing back with this one. You can see all this dense hair in here with all these different branching structures. So when you go back and look at the pollen grain here, there's all this different structure for it to get stuck onto the bee's hairs. And the parts of the body where it carries a lot of pollen, and in this case, it's gonna be right here, and especially right here, there's more branching hairs there and they're stickier and it's like almost like a Velcro. Or as if you go walking and you get one of those burdocks stuck to your leg and the pant leg right there, it's that same type of idea, but instead of, it would be also your pants also had hairs branching off of it to grab onto the burdock there too to get that pollen transferred. So it's kind of that same type of um, unique interaction going on right there. And those are types of things that you can see, you know, with different types of pollen in your yard on the flowers that you have there. You can kind of see it on the bees. All of these bees are going to be um, completely ignoring you while they're flying around and going to the flowers and stuff like that. So it's springtime and things are starting to come out. So how many species of bees do you think you're going to have in Brockton or in Massachusetts right now? Like what are you actually looking at here? Two species, okay. It's got to be more than that, I heard. <laughs> Sorry. So when I, the re only reason I started working and doing research on bees completely by accident. I was at graduate school at Northeastern, and there was a little flyer that I saw um, from E.O. Wilson's Institute and the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology, they wanted to track every living thing on the Boston Harbor Islands. So I went over to, um, and I, uh, I liked insects. I, my, my graduate research was on plants at the time. And I was like, they were like, well, we need somebody to work on bees. And I was like, well, okay, I don't know anything about bees. I was like, sure, that doesn't seem very hard. I got honeybees, I got carpenter bees, I got bumblebees. It's probably like six species. I think that's what I count on my hand. And they had all these museum case and drawers. And Massasoit may bring some of these next month uh, to show you the bees in there, just depending on it. Massasoit actually probably has the largest collection and best understanding of bee ecology in southeastern Massachusetts, probably in the entire state um, and collection there. And they opened up all these drawers in the Boston Harbor Islands. And there were, I think at that point, 60 different species they collected on the 36 islands that were there. They were metallic blue. Um, red, yellow, the black that you see here, iridescent and shiny, and I was kind of blown away. When we finished the project, we ended up collecting between 170 and 180 species in the Harbor Islands. There's about 400 in Massachusetts, 367 that have been documented there. Uh, in the world, 20,000 bee species have names and have been studied at least to get a name on it, but there's probably upwards of 30 to 35,000 through there as well too. And they break down into two major uh, groups. You got your social bees that you're familiar with, that are your honeybees and bumblebees, where there's a queen, there's different types of caste systems with workers. Some workers take care of the baby bees, some go out and collect, some clean up and stuff like that. Bumblebees and honeybees do that, and there's other smaller bees that you can do that, but that's a very small amount. The rest are all solitary, and all a solitary bee means is the females do everything other than mating, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah, so just like in humans. So um, so the queen will go out and collect, not the queen, the female will go out and collect the pollen, they'll dig the nest, they'll lay the eggs, they'll provision it you know, with nectar and pollen and sometimes oils depending on the species right through there. They'll seal everything up and fly away and do it over and over again. And in, mass, and in most areas, okay, they're almost all, the vast majority are nesting in the ground. The rest are gonna be nesting into stems and in trees and other cavities. And usually, so think of like your goldenrod stems, your plant stems that are hollow. Those are awesome habitat for bees. They're gonna nest in them. And those are called cavity nesting bees. There's also a few species, like your bigger carpenter bees, the bees that might get in your face around your house or if you've got some rotting wood, that will dig, the, that will 
chew out their own holes and nest in there. There's two groups that do that, the larger carpenter bees, which we have one species, and then a smaller carpenter bee, this is really beautiful metallic blue. There's four species in Massachusetts do that. But the most nest in your ground, and as you're walking across your lawn or walking through a field or walking through DW fields, you may be walking over hundreds to thousands of bee nests and never even notice it and see it there. So in the springtime, you've got some really wonderful bees. I'm just going to give you an overview, then I'm going to talk about owls and birds right here. But I could talk about this forever. But they're called mining bees because they dig in the ground. They, their mouth parts are like shovels because they actually dig it out right through there. And I can show you a little bit like that. But when you have your willows coming out now, your birches, your hollies, and your maples, there's tons of cherries, apples and stuff like that. There's tons of bees that specialize on those and they need pollen from those plants. Otherwise their offspring, their babies, the, the larva can't survive. And so when you especially see like the willows in the springtime, like weeping willow and other willows and maples, lots of bees are emerging at the same time that those flowers are coming out and the trees, well the willows don't because they're wind pollinated. But especially like the red maples and sugar maples, they need those bees to come in there to pollinate those flowers. And one of the major groups of that is this bee called Andrina. But you can just think of them as mining bees and nesting in the ground right here. This is a specialist Andrina that comes out uh, in the fall for goldenrod. Goldenrod and asters are super important plants in the fall because there's so many of them, so a lot of bees specialize on them uh, and only go to the, the, those ponds. In, like the bee world or like for, for uh, pollination and stuff like that, plants that are really common usually have a lot of bees that specialize on it. And plants that are rarer usually have, not always, usually have a lot of bees that visit that to kind of get those pollination services to go. But here's what one of them looks like. And you can see the beautiful rich color. You can, again, see how the hair right here kind of captures the light? And that's because the hairs are branched again. So they don't look as silvery. They kind of look like they're kind of glowing right through there. And that's the way that the light's carrying. But just to show you, like, here's the eye. So in an insect's eye, it's made up of hundreds to thousands of little eyes, like a compound eye, and those all come together to make an image. So from far away, it can see you, and it puts the thousand images into one image. But as it gets closer, it's seeing like a thousand different images when it gets closer to the flower through that. So they've got an incredible visual system. If you've ever tried to kill a fly and you're wondering why it flies away and you can't ever get it, it's because they have eyes in the top of their head too, bees, bees as well too, that see shade, like shadow and gradient. So they can see the shadow coming over. So if you come up like this, ooh, um, Sorry. If you come up like this, it sees it coming and flies away. Whereas if you come over with the side of your hand for a fly and you hit it like that, not that I'm recommending it, you, you, you'll mo much more likely to get it. There's other sensory organs, like it's a really wonderful uh, world through that. But then you can, again, here's the top of the bee. So here's the head right here, the abdomen right here, the thorax, the wings, okay. But then you'll notice the back leg right here has really thick hairs. These are just called scopal hairs, but that's where it's collecting all its pollen and packing it in there. But its whole body's covered in hairs because bees are kind of messy and it wants to collect it everywhere. And then it grooms itself and puts it onto the back legs right through there. And then again, you can see here's a, here's a, a fall mining bee on aster. And I want to kind of, in, there's about, 80 to 90 species of this specific group of mining bees that are in Massachusetts. And then I want to talk about another group of mining bees, because this one you can see um, if, in the next couple of weeks if there's an area where it occurs. And the, there could be dozens to hundreds of them. And this is called Caledes. And Caledes I really like. And this is Caledes inequalis. You don't need to know the scientific name. It, but it just means spring bee. Like in equals, it, it, it loosely translates to like spring and the coming of spring. And this is one of the first bees that comes out. This is, if you walk around and look around, there's a little mustard plant that has a name Drava that's all over the ground. If you walk outside here, it's probably blooming or going to seed right now. It's one of the first things that come out. And that's what you can see it on this little, it's this little tiny little white flower that comes out. And this is one of the first signs of spring coming out through there. And what's really neat and wonderful about these bees is they're one of the earliest ones that come out, but they form like kind of these large aggregations. And it really showed me how 
not dangerous to be worried about these specific bees. Because when I first started doing this work, I was at Nahant um, overlooking Boston Harbor, and there were all these red pines and white pines, but the ones that I was working on were red pines. And there'd be, they wouldn't be swarms where, where, where you'd notice them, but if you started to see, there'd be dozens to up to 100 flying around these pine trees, and they were scraping the pine resin off the trees and kind of mating and everything like that. And then I also noticed, too, that the, the nests would be on the ground. So over at Sheep Pasture in Easton, uh, a little after my daughter was born, I was there. Uh, it's where the pavilion is now, if you've ever been over to the Sheep Pasture. And I was sitting down, and she was, she was uh, um, sweeping up nature and cleaning it up when she was two years old there. And I looked around, I noticed the pine trees, and I just started to look a little bit, and I noticed there was, I don't know, dozens to hundreds of these bees flying around her, flying around us as we were sitting around, and they were all nesting in the ground right through there. And this is what one of their nests looks like. This is the female coming out of the nest. So if you see little raised um, dirt, you think of ant colonies and ant nests. But if you see it like being a perfect circle in the area, because they'll, they'll close everything up once they're done, and I'll talk a little bit about the nest later on. Um, they're, the, um, they're nesting there, and they never, you know, wouldn't even notice or never bother you there. And what's really neat about these bees, and I'll show you a picture of this in a little bit, when they nest in the ground, because think of living, think of the rain we just had, and all that water coming in, and the standing water right now. Think of if your home was in the ground as a bee, right? You're gonna, you know, and all the bacteria and all the fungus that grows. Think of what, like if fungus is killing your plants and everything like that. These bees, using different parts of their mouths, their bodies, they can line their home and make it waterproof. This one actually produces a wax in its mouth and lines the entire thing, uh, lines their entire nest, which I'll show you in a second, with a wax. But they can also put down antibiotics and antifungals that we really don't even know what they are to protect it about there, where they're basically s setting all of that up in a very harsh environment where they're not only uh, surviving, they're thriving through there. So there's just so much we don't know until we kind of, you know, start to look. And I'll show you that in a second too. But here's what this bee looks like, you know, when you when you start to look at it closely. And these, all these photos are done by the uh, bee monitoring lab uh, as part of the United States Geological Service down in Maryland through there. So one last bee that I want to show you that's going to start to come up would be a little bit later. But these are going to be in everybody's garden. I heard somebody talking about starting echinacea earlier and coneflower, you'll see these on coneflower in most gardens. You'll see these on black-eyed Susans, those open top of flowers, sunflowers through there. But these are green sweat bees. We've got uh, about eight species in three different groups that are going to be in the Brockton area through that. And they're these beautiful metallic colors. Okay. So eyes, this, this is the head. This will be in your gardens, you know, come July, August. It's going to be in there in June, but it's going to be in lower numbers there. But just these beautiful, beautiful colors. Okay. If you see one that's green with this black atom right here, it's, we only have one species like that in the state. So you're going to see this in, I, I see, I, I live in downtown Mansfield, right in the, right in, you know, on a quarter acre. I have sun, I have lots of native plants in there, but it's a very small lot. Um, we have these all summer, right through there. You know, here's what it looks like when you see it on a thistle. Right here. Here's a, here's a similar species in the same group on a, on a golden rod right through there. This one just happens to be all green right through there. You know. <clears throat> so, just a little bit of the nesting cycle because, you know, these ground nesting bees, when they're adults, that might be 5 or 10% of their life at most. They're mostly stuck in a dark cave uh, for their entire life in the ground through that when they come out. But they're going to dig um, anywhere between, you know, let's say this is the ground surface, you know, a couple inches to a foot, maybe down to four feet, depending on the species and the type of soil that's going to be right, right through there. So as the female does that, you're going to see here there's a little bit of a wax on there, so they're waterproofing it. Think 800 to 1,000 flowers to get enough for one egg, okay? So that's about 400 flowers. I'm just, you know, this is, uh, these are pictures taken by Roman Thort out in California at a vernal pool. So here is the completed pollen ball, 
and then the egg is right there. And what's really neat about this is when the egg hatches, the bee reabsorbs the shell. So it'd be like if a chicken hatched and it just took the shell inside of itself. And then it just looks like a caterpillar or a grub and it eats the pollen and it also is eating, uh, um, excuse me, it's getting the nitrogen to produce the proteins in the pollen. It's getting specific fats to turn them into certain hormones so it can develop from a baby into an adult and that's, that's, that can be plant specific as well too. And then it spends the majority of its life is in this pupa, pre-pupa stage, so kind of bee, kind of larva, you know, kind of, if it's a caterpillar, it's kind of butterfly, kind of caterpillar, kind of in that stage. And it's waiting for the temperature to be right and the moisture in the soil to be right for it to come up. You know, in Massachusetts, these mining bees, they're typically gonna come up every year. But just think, just think if you were in the desert in Arizona or in New Mexico, you've gotta wait for the rain for the flowers to go out. So they could be five, 10 years in the ground before they actually come out there as well too, depending on the air. So that's the basic nest. Here's just a, when I was in re doing research down in Arizona and learning about this, where we're actually looking at bee nests in the ground. So it can be sandy or um, you know, compact soil or loose soil that you can see here. Here's a picture that I took on uh, Cuddy Hunker Penikees Island in the dunes, but here there's a dime right here, there's a quarter right there, just to kind of show you the bee nest holes right there. Yeah. You know, these are all different bee nests right here. This is what I meant by like the perfect circle. Here's an excavation, you know, six inches, eight inches coming down through there. But it's gonna create an empty like apartment or cell right here. It's gonna start putting in pollen. You know, it's gonna lay an egg on a completed pollen ball. The egg is gonna have to eat it. Okay, it's gonna finish consuming the pollen here and then just kind of wait for those conditions to be right. So I just wanna show you a little bit about these. You know, if you're going for walks and you're seeing like some side walls, it can be smaller or larger. They bees like nesting onto the kind of side soil walls like that. So here, those two pictures, this is another Calides bee. These come to Holly a lot in the spring. But this is like the side of a bank on a river. And these are pliers right here, just to give you a sense of the size of it. Every dot that you see, so right here, there's 12 dots right there. There's maybe 30 dots in that circle right here. So right here, you're looking at hundreds to, you know, maybe low thousands in this one for this one species of bee um, through that. But what do you think in your lawn? So here's the queen, here's the female bee. It digs a central tunnel and then it branches off. So here's the one it's working on, but then here's another little bee, little bee, little bee, little bee, little bee, little bee. And this is what it'll look like in your lawn. And this was a study done in 1980 in suburban Maryland. So just think Brockton, but down in Maryland right there on a one acre lawn. And there they estimated, and this is what all the little dots are, the circle, the arrows are right here. In that one lawn, they found over 100,000 bee nests in that one long because they had the right conditions and everything like that. And the people had no idea they had any bees that were nesting there. So they didn't bother them or do anything to it. But, you know, for example, when you're eating, you know, your strawberries, um, your blueberries, like in the springtime and stuff like that, I could show videos on this. Um, you know, you're not going to have any of that fruit without any of these pollination services, and the bees are really important uh, for doing that. So here's the same picture, but see the wax right there and right there? That's the Kalides nest, where they actually line it with a waxy substance that they're producing in their mouth. And there is almost certainly antifungal and antibacterial stuff going in there as well, too, um, to do that. But that's my little bit. I can talk again for hours on bees, but that's just a little bit on the spring bees that you're going to be seeing. But before I move on to owls and my bird migration, just to you know be interested to stay within the time limit, does anybody have any questions about bees or anything like that? Yes. So the question is, what native plants would I recommend uh, as being really good um, for native bees? So there's. It depends on the obviously the soil conditions and everything like that. But things that I really like. Um, that work really well. You know, you can have goldenrod and common milkweed, but those do really well in a lot of meadows and fields. 
I think bee bombs are really good to get a lot. Ironweed is excellent um, as well. It's March, so I'm not in my brain space for, for the plants. Um, New England aster, New York aster are excellent. Um, and I'll start to think of more as, oh, wild strawberry, amazing, because it, it does a great job of providing uh, almost like a mulch, and it's a wonderful under, um, like a, a low uh, green plant, and it, it spreads and grows really well there as well, too. Uh, butterfly weed, which is at a lot of garden centers, is really good there as well. And as I think of some other ones, uh, and I can send plant lists, too. Yes. Everything you read and hear is that these are you. Is that just a falsehood? So the question is everything that you read and hear, bees are doomed. Um, and it, de no, it depends on the certain types of bees. Um, you know, there are a lot of bee populations that are declining or are unknown. But providing habitat through native plants and, and, and removing lawn, you can make a huge impact locally. At Massasoit, you know, where we had native plants in a meadow, um, it was outside the president's office, there were 10 times more bees right there than it was just 100 feet away where it was mowed. And the more people that are just providing even just a little habitat, could be container gardens, can actually be converting lawn, anything like that, the, the, the bees will have the food that they need in the habitat, and that's also going to provide food for for wild birds and stuff like that as well too. So it depends, but there's a lot of hope with um, the right management, right right changes. So for example, too, like in the springtime, you'll, you, I mean, you see this everywhere. Um, people with lawn care and stuff like that for putting pesticides to get rid of the grubs in the lawn. Well, when you do that, you're going to kill also all the bees because it's basically a uh, a broad spectrum pesticide and stuff like that. The mosquito spraying there as well too at the wrong time of day or just anything like that, that will have a huge impact there as well. So small steps can have a, a big positive impact. Certain things with a, certain parasites that are attacking uh, five bumblebees, three on the east coast, two on the west coast, that's a different story where they are going to have a much tougher time um, coming back and I talk, can talk more about that too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So then the question that was just asked was about the almond crops, but honeybees in particular. So honeybees are, are a much different story than, than native bees. Honeybees, um, especially, you know, like the California almonds and stuff like that, uh, are more like an agricultural crop themselves, like cattle, where they're there to provide a service. And they're um, originally from, from Europe, but the way that they're managed, especially for the almond crop is the almonds, I think, bloom for three to five weeks. So instead of having honeybees that are there for the entire year, because there's no food with, at the almond trees, they're being trucked up from, say, Florida, then going to California, and then going to, say, Michigan for the blueberries and being moved around like that. So their genetics are also very small, like the pool of genetics there is very small, so they're susceptible to a lot of different diseases and stuff like that. There's also a lot of introduced disease and mites that they're with, so honeybees themselves get a lot of pesticide, miticide, and also the pesticides and, and uh, herbicides that are from the environment, so they're hit a lot with that, so they're under a lot of stress. So when they're, they're, they're much more susceptible to having those die-offs that you can see in colony collapse disorder. Okay, yes? Um, so I have Yes.
So the question is about holly trees and seeing bees nesting near the holly. So when you see like this green swept bee right here, it will normally only forage, if possible, a football field in distance. So very close to where it is. The farther it has to go, the more energy it's gonna use and the less reproduction that it's gonna have right there. And this is one of the bees that's gonna be pollinating the holly is this mining bee right there. So they typically like to stay as close as they can um, to the, the, the food because of the energy that they need to, to spend in flying, yeah. Yeah, they just go back and forth, back and forth. Like eight, they have to, like for that, they have to visit about 800 flowers just to get enough for one set of pollen to feed one one egg. And they typically want to, the more flowers that are close by, the more the more um, eggs they'll lay, so the more bees they'll have next year. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I hadn't realized bees lived in the so this is opening my yeah. eyes. <laughs> Not bees then. Okay, there so, are wasps or kind. yeah. So the question there is: so, so wasps, same, same, same group as bees. Wasps are carnivorous and are going to be um, eating or stinging insects to feed to their offspring. Kind of the same thing with pollen. And they can be much more aggressive and territorial. They'll nest in the ground there as well too. So if they're openly being aggressive like that, it's almost certainly going to be a wasp, and it's almost. I would, I would suspect, unless it's a bald-faced hornet, that it's going to be more likely in set, aug, late August to through, through early October, right through there. But certain wasps will definitely defend their colony because if something gets in there, everything's over because that's where, you know, like the, the, it's defending their home and stuff like that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Owls? Okay. All right. So right before I got here, I went to look at an owl sitting on a nest at, at the museum uh, where I work. I work at a 125-acre wildlife sanctuary. So this is a great horned owl, and it is actively nesting right now. Uh, it might even be the same one. We don't ban them or tag them, so I'm not sure. And believe it or not, I'm gonna also talk about the barred owls. This is also incredibly important for owls. This is more so for the barred owl right here. If you look at a quarter in your pocket or just think of that size, this is smaller than that. This is a spring peeper, okay? And you'll probably start hearing them. You may have already started to hear them. It's a little colder now. But I just wanna show you, that's its hands, or web feet or whatever. This is, a, this is a red maple leaf, and you can see how small it actually is. And this is louder than a Metallica concert when it's calling. So it's about 120 decibels, between 90 and 120. It's calling right here. I took this picture two years ago, right around this time. It was a little warmer, warmer then as well there. And so I'm gonna to talk about both of those and what's going on in the spring. But here's our great horned owl. You're almost certainly, Thorny Lee I drove by right there. There's almost certainly one sitting up in a pine tree, probably flying over the golf course right now um, as well too, just like this one is here. But you know, what does the nesting actually look like? And if we had more time, show videos of the nest and stuff like that, I, I can show you those on Cornell. But last year, we had one nesting in a white pine tree. And our property manager owned, and I would go, go out and take looks at, you know, look at it constantly. And we noticed, he noticed one day, not me, that one of them had fallen, one of the babies had fallen out of the nest. When they're a couple weeks old, this will happen, and they, can, they have very powerful legs where they can climb back up and get back in the nest, it's called branching. And then the next day, another one fell out. The nest, the great horned owls use nests of other birds or squirrels or anything like that. And they're not the best, this one was very tiny and it cut its beak. Norm Smith is the former director of the Blue Hills Trailside Museum that Mass Audubon runs at the base of Blue Hills. It's a small zoo with non-releasable animals, deer, snowy owls, more like that. And he's worked in owl conservation for also 40 years. At that same time, he had got a phone call about a great horned owl, owlet, a fledgling, 
uh, in a dog's mouth at a dog park in Norwell because its nest was above the dog's park and it fell out. So he took the two owls that had fallen out of the nest there, he put a little antibiotics where its beak was, and then we built this little platform for it to go in. And you can see it right here. So here's one, here's two, and what's really wonderful about owls, this is an adopted owl right here. That's the, that's the one that was in the dog's mouth there, you know, um, through that, through there. Here are, the, here are the other two, okay? In May, we don't really advertise it too much until after they're gone because they can be susceptible just in terms of like increased human activity. They're right in the middle of the sanctuary and you can hear them calling and begging for their parents right there. So a few days later, I go out and now there's one and two. Those are the ones that were there. And then up three and four. So the owls that we had there ended up fostering, adopting two of the owls. Normally, one might make it out of the four. But last year, as best as we can tell, all four of them made it through there, uh, through the entire summer. And so what's really neat about great horn owls, and again, you're going to have great habitat at DW Fields, Thorny Lee, but also just in a lot of different areas in Brockton. Um, they do really well in kind of like, you know, suburban uh, areas with fields and stuff nearby because of the increase in squirrels, owls, rodents, and stuff like that through there as well, too. Uh, but it's just such a wonderful story, and I was able to get some really great pictures of them um, through there. And those are the great horn owls. I play their sound, but I can't get the sound to work uh, for my computer to go into the um, projector. So I apologize for that. But another owl that you're going to have here is barred owls too. And I want to talk about them because they're really active here. And I play the sound, but this is the one that goes, hoo, 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 hoo. I can't do it as well. Who cooks for you all? Like it is hoo, hoo, who cooks for you all? Okay? Um, through that. And so this is another owl that's really, that, that, that actually spends time in the sanctuary. He's probably nesting and I don't know where it is. And a lot of times I get at this point like, well, how come I can't find any owls? Okay, because I bet at least half the people in this room within the past two weeks walked by this owl. So where is this owl? And this owl is an eastern screech owl. It sounds like a horse. We need to go the size of the URL model, the size of the model. Okay? This owl took me ten, I, it took me ten minutes to find this owl. I was on a grew, I was on a walk, and the reason I heard chickadees, blue jays, and crows going, getting very upset. So, I looked. They, they like community patrol. They kind of police the area, and there's the eye. There's the eye. There's the beak. Okay, here it is zoomed in. Here's the eye, here's the eye, here's the beak, okay? It was wearing a hat, too, okay? But you can't see it, it's obscured by the leaves. And then here they are both. And I didn't see this owl until it actually opened its eyes. This is an eastern screech owl. It does really, it'll do also do well in, 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 in the Brockton area as well too, but it blends in so well because it's hard to, I'll show this more on the other one. There's lights and darks here, so it looks like the trees, it looks like the dappling light coming in, and it stands, so when your eye, you could be looking right at it, and it's an owl, and your brain will just see tree, and if you're going too quick, you will not see it. And then, so here's one as well. Okay. That's the great horn owl. And then here it is mad at me. Okay. You know, very cat-like there as well too, but they especially during the day, they're active during the day, but they're mostly sitting and roosting, but they'll fly, they'll hunt, but they're mostly digesting meals and kind of hanging out and waiting and just trying to not be noticed and not be bothered there. Um, through that as well. But 
that's almost always, you, you'll probably walk by and, and not see owls, but the owls will see you. You know, I don't know how frequently, depending on where you're walking, but at DW Fields, you're almost certainly going to be walking by one every fourth time that you're walking uh, there, if not sooner. But the barred owls that I want to talk about here, um, here's one that I took in early May, but I want you to think of this time here, because the barred owls are going to be waiting and watching. Okay, so just think of it watching and looking down right there. And this one I only saw because it was being chased by a hawk, and the hawk was being chased by a blue jay, and the owl landed in the tree. But they're up there waiting and watching, and right now they're waiting and watching because of these. These are wood frogs. And if you go walking at DW Fields on a warm day, you may hear a lot of quacking. These, again, I can't put the sound in, I have the sound in there. But they quack, they kind of look, they sound, kind of sound like ducks. But they're going to vernal pools. And a vernal pool is just a pond that fills up with rain and snow. There's no water coming in and out. And it's really important for a lot of animals, including like these frogs, because they're coming there, they're calling, they're fighting, they're competing, mostly over these sticks. Okay, they're doing that because that's where they're going to lay their eggs. You can see it right here. Um, you can see laying the egg right there. As they start to warm up as the war as, as it warms up and the, the ice starts to thaw the wood frogs the spring peepers come out wood frogs are really amazing because they can freeze totally solid through the winter they stay above the frost line their heart stops their they stop breathing you can see right here the wood frog is on the ice right there this was a picture i took two years ago they fill their body up with sugar and also some antifreeze proteins there so they're like a like a pepsi that is frozen in the fridge it gets syrupy, but the cells bend, but they don't break. And then once it is a warm day, you won't be able to hear the sound here, but you can see the ripples. There's about 500 wood frogs in here where all the ripples are. And it's really, really loud. So they're coming out when it's warm, even though the ice is on it. No, that's at the Museum of American Bird Art in Canton. But you'll see the same thing at DW Fields Park. Um, as well too. And what I want to show you too as we're looking at this, I want to give you the above view and also the below view. So while this is happening, these little ponds are so important. Okay. So as you go under here, this is under the water of one of these ponds. This was taken a little bit earlier in the year, but this is the size, and you put your arms out, that might be the field of view. And there is easily a thousand fairy shrimp shown right here. This is going to be a DW Fields or anywhere else. The frogs are going to be eating those in there, but there are also a lot of other things that are going to be eating the stuff that's underneath there. In this one vernal pool that I just showed you the picture of, there's easily a million things living in the water right there. Insects, tiny things that you need to see with a microscope, the stuff like the fairy shrimp that I showed you right here, that's all really critical for the entire forest ecosystem. We have an underwater camera that we're able to take these images with. This again was a little bit before uh, that video that I showed you there. And the frogs are there to lay their eggs because there's not fish and there's not a lot of predators through there as it's coming in. So here, this is actually underwater video of the eggs. So these are all wood frog eggs. There's tadpoles here. Every white thing swimming around is a living thing here. You can see the tadpole going down right there. They shall start to notice at the vernal ponds, the DW fields and other places over the next couple of weeks. And this, look right here. You'll actually see a little wood frog tadpole hatching. Here's like the above and below view. Okay, so again, in this one little spot, you're looking at several thousand wood frog eggs as you go farther back. You know, in that one pond, we typically will have between 5,000 and 15,000 wood frog eggs, if not more. We'll also have spotted salamander eggs. But you're like, well, this, these are, this is owls. What's going on here? But the owls are watching and waiting here. Okay, and I want you to watch this spot right here. So that's the owl 
flying into the pool or pond and pulling a frog out. We have under we have uh, cameras that turn on when there's movement. That's what's going on there. And they liked it so much they used it as a perch. That's the great that's the barred owl perching on the trail camera. It's flying into the water. And then watch the barred owl's legs. It's hard to tell when they get longer. Because it's hunting for frogs and salamanders there. So it pulled out a frog there. On pitch black nights where they can't see it at all, they can actually use their ears. If their ears are a little bit higher on one side and a little bit lower on the other side. So they can calculate the difference in time that the sound gets from one ear and another. You calculus and know where the thing is in the water. Certain owl species can actually tell where it is in the water or it's under the water. Because you know like it's refractory, you put a pencil in and move. They can tell where it's sound. Because the frogs are trying to reproduce and uh, for the next generation to lay the eggs right through here. Salamanders are also in there as well too that are right there. And that's happening all right now um, as well too. So the question is what makes a pond a vernal pond? So vernal ponds are really special. They're going to be typically down lower in, um, in the woods, like lower elevation, and they only get their water from rain and snow. So there's no stream coming in, no stream coming out, there's no spring bubbling up through there. So it's all from rain and snow water. So in the summertime, they're almost always mostly dry or completely dried up, and a lot of the animals need that drying for the life cycle to work. The fairy shrimp eggs have to dry out. Uh, and then for, for them to hatch the next year. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I yes? I have a problem with squirrels. Sure. I have gotten an owl on my mind. So, I mean, one thing that you, so one thing that you could do is it, you can put up an owl box. So owls, barred owls and screech owls, they nest in tree cavities. And you could encourage an owl, again, the percentage of it that will adopt yours is, is low, but you can, put, you can put a box up for that size um, there as well, too. Yeah. Yes? Yes. So, so the questions about eagles down at Miles Standish and eagles nests and uh, somebody saying that the eagles didn't come back because the owls keep them away. So great horn owls will, start, will, will use other birds' nests. Um, they'll nest typically between January up through April depending on when they first lay their eggs. So they're mostly not going to overlap with the eagles. Um, so it's unlikely that a great horned owl would drive an eagle off because eagles are one of the few things that might mess with a great horned owl or kind of put up a fight with it there. But if they had another option, they may have also just done a nest nest there as well too. Yeah. It could be the owls, and it, it could be they're just not nesting every year because of energetics and stuff like that. But the bald eagle population in Massachusetts. From, from being down at zero in, in the 70s because of DDT and, and other declines and stuff like that. There's, a well o there's a over 100 nesting pairs in Massachusetts. It's one of the huge success, conservation success stories along with the bird behind me, the, the blue, eastern bluebird. Yeah. Um, yes? So the question is, where do all the frogs and salamander go when the vernal pond dries up? The frogs spend their entire, the wood frogs that I showed you, spend their entire time in, in the woods, uh, in the leaf litter, under trees, uh, under down logs. 
Same thing with the salamanders. So they only come together to mate for that like one week to two weeks. Yeah. Um, They'll spread well way far away. You'll have large migrations of salamanders uh, on a rainy night in, in, in March going to the vernal pool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Want to Want me to do a little bit on spring birds before we finish up? Okay. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about migration and spring birds here. So, and you should start seeing eastern bluebirds at DW fields already if they didn't spend the whole winter there. They're going to start, they're one of our earlier nesting birds um, that come through there. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about migration, what's going on. I'll do that for about 10 minutes and I'll happy, happily answer any questions. So I'm going to use this bird a little bit. This is a, um, a yellow rumped warbler. And this will be one of our earlier warblers that migrates back. It doesn't nest in Massachusetts, but it might, it doesn't nest in Brockton in this area, but it will migrate through Brockton. You'll hear this and see this at DW Fields uh, late April, uh, mid to late April to early May as it's moving along. But I kind of want to talk about, you know, what's happening this time period, why, why birds are migrating and stuff like that. And I want to just use this picture of the tufted titmouse. Oh, this is a great bird to listen for, too. Uh, again, I can't get the sound to play here, but this is like three short whistles. It's Peter, 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 but it's kind of like <laughs> that you'll hear in the mornings and stuff like that. That's a little too much like a cardinal, but it's close enough. We hear it in threes. Starting around New Year's, you'll start to hear this in early mornings, and now it's going to be calling most of the day incessantly. But this, is again, you can see the native dogwood tree behind us. I took this picture a little bit before the pandemic, but you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight caterpillars in its beak right there. Okay, here's a magnolia warbler. You can see a caterpillar, and I don't know what happened to the caterpillar there. It just disappeared um, through that. Again, you can see the, the caterpillar right there. So these birds are tracking when the leaves come out of the trees. One of the reasons certain birds come back earlier is because they might be getting insects from somewhere else. But every nesting bird other than a goldfinch that you see in the spring and summertime in, in Brockton and in Massachusetts, it almost certainly gets needs protein from insects. You know, it's 96% of nesting birds in Massachusetts, nesting songbirds, get their protein from insects. So that's where I have the yellow rumped warbler here as well too. On this cherry, you can see it's kind of coming down here. Here's not a great picture that I took over at Sheep Pasture, but I just want to watch the progression here. Look, it's going into the oak catkin right here. And then look, it's got a caterpillar that it pulled right out of there. There might be 40 caterpillars, 20 caterpillars in just these little pictures of the oak leaves and catkins coming out through here. They're voracious at going after these caterpillars. They need it. That's how they fuel their migration. And here's another picture of the yellow rump warbler. And here's another one right here. But this is one of our earlier migrants, but it's also one of our later migrants. You'll see this later on in the fall. I took this picture in a parking lot uh, over in Canton. This is in a, either a red maple or an ornamental maple just over in Canton on 138. I looked above me and it was right there. But this kind of goes back later. Here's another picture of it. Um, that I took over in Canton. But something really amazing happens in the fall. And I want to highlight this because there's all these wonderful little stories that you have uh, of everything going on that you may or may not know and nobody might not know. But this might be your least favorite vine if you're looking at this. It's on poison ivy right now, okay? You can see it by the root hairs coming out of it. You see any vine that has root hairs coming out of it, don't touch it, okay? If somebody you don't like, you can have them touch it, okay? Because it's gonna be poison ivy, okay? But what happens here is this bird spends a little bit longer. It doesn't need to uh, migrate as soon because you can see the berries right here. This is poison ivy flowers. Here's poison ivy berries on the bottom. This is bay berry that you can see right here, okay? Here's a picture of that yellow rumped warbler on poison ivy. It eats really waxy fruits like bayberry and poison ivy. But in the spring and summer, it's eating a lot of insects. Its digestive system completely changes before it migrates back. It actually gets longer 
and it actually changes the enzymes that are used to break things down. You know, like they might use to break things down. And so its whole digestive system changes, and it moves from insects to fruit, where a lot of other birds don't do that. They, you know, they're just eating insects the entire time. They're migrating back. And, you know, you can see this with robins as well, too. You know, if you see robins flicking around in the springtime here and doing this little dance and throwing the leaves all over, you can see that a lot. You know, they're eating worms and insects. Robins are one of the only birds that actually feed their babies worms. You know, and it just so happens that's what you think all the birds are doing. But robins are one of the only ones that are doing it. So their digestive system is one way during this time to kind of process all this stuff. And in the late fall and winter, it's fruit, fruit, and more fruit. And it, so that their system is also changing right there. So as you're looking at it, their whole internal anatomy, both the chemicals that they're producing, but sometimes even the actual structure of their intestines is changing. Same thing with the yellow rump warbler through there. So if we look at migration here, whoops. So if we look at migration here, okay, this is a painting from the Museum of American Bird Art by Charlie Harper called Mystery of the Missing Migrants. And this was a painting done by Charlie in the 90s, a little bit like Silent Spring and Rachel Carson, to draw attention to what he had noticed, he was an avid bird watcher throughout his entire life, what he had noticed is declines in his favorite migratory birds um, through here. And I want to kind of highlight this because I want to show you with hummingbirds, you know, because these are going to start coming back. This is just a picture of my front yard. If you plant it, it will come with hummingbirds. So things like ironweed, bee balm, cardinal flower, lobelia. Uh, if you don't want to go for that and you just want to have a hanging basket, um, uh, the hang it's, it's salvia. No, not salvia. Impatient. Fuchsia, thank you. Yeah, fuchsia. If you hang that, they're going to come through, through there. This is right in the front yard. If I had internet access, I'd show you a building and nest right now here, too. Um, so what I want to show here, this is going to be a video of um, throughout the entire year of hummingbirds. Right, well, right in January, this is January, they're in Central America, Mexico, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, maybe getting into Panama, but this is where all our living bird hummingbirds are spending their winter time, okay? This is, if you, anybody watch, watches birds and uploads bird data to eBird, which is part of Cornell, your data, is, your data could be in here, and I wanna show this. So it's gonna to start to move February, March, April, whoosh, May, June, July, August, September, whoosh, October, November, December. So ruby throated hummingbirds in red, this is where they're breeding. So you can get up to eastern, uh, southern Canada, all the way down through Florida. Blue's winter, okay? And then yellow is where they're migrating through, right through that. So that's gonna be happening, you know, in the middle of really early, uh, early May for us. But some birds that have already started to come back are red-winged blackbirds. You'll hear these. The males come back, the females haven't come back. The males kind of compete to find a really good territory for a couple of weeks and then the females come back and decide who to mate with. Okay, with the setup, you'll start to see catbirds coming back soon. Some are actually because of climate change and just, you know, it's, it's just not as harsh in the winter. We had one that lived the whole winter in Canton. Uh, uh, you know, I saw it in uh, January and February there. But these will start to come back a little bit later. You might have seen some bluebirds already. They're not migrating as much as they used to. They're mostly spending the winter here, a lot of them, but some will still migrate. But I just want to talk a little bit about bird migration here. You know, this is a yellow warbler. This is going to nest at DW Fields. Um, it's going to be active all summer here. But this, along with other birds, there's going to be hundreds of millions of birds migrating Sorry. Migrating through the country, end of April through May, well over one to two billion birds total will be moving through um, migration. They're almost all the songbirds, okay, are going to be flying at night. You can see in this picture with the stars. You can see this painting. I mean, you can see the palm trees right there. They're going to take off a little bit after dusk, 
and fly all the way through dawn. Some will fly several days, depending, you know, if you're looking at shorebirds and plovers and stuff like that, depending on it there, where they might be aloft through 60 to 100 hours. You know, how do we know this? You know, just to give you a little bit of sense of this, and I'll, 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 I'll take some questions in just a little bit. But weather radar is really excellent at seeing birds fly at night. In other areas, this is the Delaware Gap, so Delaware and New Jersey, this is Cape May, New Jersey right there. Those are really important migratory flyways, and believe it or not, they put out recording devices, point them right up at the sky, and record bird song at night. Okay, birds sing at night differently than when they sing during the day. There's also weather radar that's there, but they'll also put up heat guns and thermal imaging cameras to catch the heat flying over from the flock of birds there as well too. And if you look at this, here's our yellow warbler down here. Okay, where's the common yellow throat? It's somewhere in there, it's a lot of birds. Uh, hmm. Oh, anyway. anyway, they all have their unique flight calls. So they can actually take the recording that they got down in Delaware right here, run it through a computer and tell how many birds and what species are coming over based on the flight calls that are right there. You know, this is last September, 220 million birds one night, 260 million birds the next night, 340 million birds the following night right through there, and just three nights, almost a billion birds aloft in the sky right through those three nights that you're gonna see um, th through there. Songbirds almost exclusively migrate at night. Hawks and raptors will migrate during the day, yeah. Um, you know, just to kind of show, uh, let me see, is this, uh, do I have a video here? Yeah, okay. So right here, I want to just show you this picture. These are, every dot is a radar station, like this, okay? So see the bright colors right there? See the bright colors right there? The brightest means the more birds are migrating. This is birds taking off to migrate at night. And this is in October on one of those larger nights right through there. The flocks are so big, they're being picked up by weather radar. You know, here, this is the Florida Keys. This is February 17th, um, 2020. Again, Florida was gonna have migration a little bit earlier. Watch this. Oh. I don't have an internet signal. I thought I had that. I thought it was recording. It gets red, like a, like a huge storm. So everybody, pick. Hold on, and see they're all coming across. Um, sorry, I don't have a why. I, I thought I had that. I thought I had that saved, but it's it's all a recording. Um, again, a flock of about five hundred thousand birds flew across the keys, and it was big enough to look like a thunderstorm. Um, I'd be happy to send somebody the video of that. Um, sorry about that. You know, so where does it, what does this mean for us? You know, if you love, you know, Orioles coming back, for example, you know, if you want to see blue wing warblers, these are all pictures I took just in, you know, areas like DW Field, Palm warblers, Nashville warblers, these are mostly outside my office, right, right by Washington Street in Canton, you know. Peak migration for our, between May 9th and May 12th. But you're gonna to start to see this at the end of April um, to the beginning of, you know, to the middle of May, right through that. Um, and just to finish up, I wanna tie it back, I wanna just talk about the chickadee, okay? Because everybody's, you know, everybody likes the chickadee right through there. Here's a chickadee nest. I took a picture of this about six years ago. How many insects do those chickadees need to eat over three weeks to survive? You know, here's a male or female chickadee. If you go for walks near wetlands and you see a really kind of dead tree right there, chickadees, believe it or not, act like woodpeckers, okay? And they excavate it out, really soft wood. They nested nest boxes, that's a baby chickadee right there. 
But if you look at these, and this ties it back into the pollinators, the native plants, you know, oak trees can have up to 600 species of different caterpillars eating it. You can have a Florida dogwood, which is their native dogwood, can be over 200 species of caterpillars. You could have a kozu dogwood, zero caterpillars. So kind of like a desert versus non-desert there. And just imagine me and the graduate student counting the birds coming back every day with how many chickadees, uh, caterpillars in their mouth. You know, a chickadee needs to collect about 8,000 caterpillars on average, anywhere ranging between six and 9,000, six and 10,000 caterpillars over three to four weeks to, for all five of these to make it to this point. If it gets 4,000 or 5,000, you might only end up getting one right through there. And you can have locally a really strong impact, you know, just in having a few extra native plants in your yard, planting an oak tree, and especially encouraging other people or being a, a model of that for other people there as well, too. But just in the interest of time with that, thank you so much, and I'd be happy to take any questions or chat. <laughs>